word of hope and comfort as we consider God's holy word this morning. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Let us pray. Most gracious and holy God, it is out of your steadfast love and daily mercies that you sent your son Jesus to be a friend to sinners. We give you hearty thanks for the gift of salvation that is only found in him, by whose name we pray. Amen. I don't know where it comes from or why so many people believe it. But there is a thought out there that the God of the Old Testament is different from the God of the New Testament. Such people reason that in the Old Testament, God seems to focus on punishment and destruction, where in the New Testament, he focuses on compassion and mercy. That perception simply isn't true. That's why I chose to greet you from a passage from Lamentations, one of the saddest books in the Bible. Even in the midst of his pain and persecution, Jeremiah steps away from his lamenting to speak of the hope that we all have in God. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. There new every morning, great is your faithfulness. It is the psalmist who writes of God, you have dwelt well with your servant, O Lord, according to your word. And who then goes on to reflect that the law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. Today's Old Testament reading from Hosea explains how God moves us to repentance for the sake of our salvation, saying, Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us that he may heal us. He has struck us down and he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live before him. Let us know. Let us press on to know the Lord. His going out is as sure as the dawn. He will come to us as the showers, as the spring rains that water the earth. St. Paul says of God of the Old Testament, for what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, those wages are not counted as a gift, but are his due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. God in the Old Testament is just as loving and merciful as he is in the New Testament. He is the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion as sin, as Moses reports in Exodus 34. In today's gospel reading, we're told that as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the text booth and he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came to call the righteous, not to call the righteous, but sinners. So as Jesus continues to add members to his apostolic entourage, he doesn't come across as being very discerning in his selections to people. I mean, his first choices were all fishermen. Two sets of brothers, Simon and Andrew, James and John. Theirs were hardly the set of credentials that would impress religious types. 
add to them a tax collector by the name of Matthew and you have quite a motley group from common fishermen with little or no education to a hated collaborator of the Romans who collected their taxes with a substantial surcharge to cover his expenses. A group of ne'er-do-wells, if ever there was. No rabbinical students. No honest tradesmen or merchants. No upstanding men of promise or pedigree. Stinky commoners with a low-life tax collector. Yeah, the religious heights were not impressed. And when everyone reclined at the table, presumably in Matthew's house, the Pharisees became increasingly dubious since many tax collectors and sinners were, came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. For the religious types, this kind of behavior on the part of a teacher of the faith was scandalous. The rabbis would never condone such behavior, let alone participate in it. And so they object and voice their complaint to the disciples. Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? They had no time, no place for such people in their religiosity. Such people would find no welcome in their synagogues. So why would Jesus want to be a friend of sinners? Well, of course, Jesus heard what they said. And he didn't let it go unchallenged. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. While the religious types only wanted to be with and to deal with people of a higher caliber, of a greater social standing, than all this riffraff that Jesus chose to deal with. Lord came for those who needed mercy. While the religious types turned their backs and walked away from the troubled and the down and out, Jesus sought out the despised and the dejected. And when it became time, Jesus went to the cross for the sake of the sin sick of the world, healing their diseases their hearts, their minds, through his outpoured blood. He took their place, and ours, by the way, before the wrath and condemnation of the Holy God so we wouldn't have to. Why? Well, because Jesus truly is a friend of sinners. And he still is. And this is where the religious types then and now get it all wrong. Such people believe that church is only meant for good people, whoever they may be. If a known prostitute, for example, entered this sanctuary, how would they be greeted, honestly? How more likely would they be greeted with a judgmental, well, what are you doing here, than a handshake or a hug? We might let them sit in our pew, but we're going to fumigate it before we ever sit there again. Oh yes, we'd like to think that we would treat them better than that, but honestly, would we? Could we? Or what if one of the homeless in the area decided to come to church one Sunday? With dirty clothes and a definitive odor, how close would we be to willing to stand or even sit by them? Now we'd like to think that we'd all do better, but... Those who are well have no need for a physician, but those who are sick, Jesus said. Understanding Jesus' mission to seek and to save the lost, then it should be no surprise that he is a friend of sinners. And thankfully, that means he's a friend of ours. We sing, what a friend we have in Jesus, all our griefs and sins to bear, because he is our friend. He befriends all who would come to him. His heart is pictured by Hosea in today's Old Testament reading who writes, For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Tony Campello tells of a time when he flew from the East Coast out to Hawaii to lead a church conference. Now because of the time difference, he woke up in the early hours of the morning and he just couldn't get back to sleep. 
He looked out his window and he spotted an all-night diner right across the street. So he went over for a cup of coffee. The clientele was made up of blue-collar shift workers and prostitutes. It was a true greasy spoon sort of place. Now a group of the ladies of the night made their way and sat down in the booth next to Tony's. One of them mentioned that the next day was going to be her birthday. Tony visited with all the people seated around him. And when that particular girl got up and walked out, he suggested that they throw her a surprise birthday party the next night. Everyone agreed that would be great. Someone volunteered to decorate the diner. Someone else said they'd bring hats and party favors. Tony asked the owner of the diner to order up a nice cake, and he would pay for it. The plans were all set. The next night, everyone came to the diner a little early and set everything up before the birthday girl arrived. When she did come in, she was in total shock as everyone began to sing. And then the tears began to flow as they brought her the cake to cut. I can't cut it, she said. I've never had a birthday cake in my life. Can I just take it home? And with that, she left. And as she walked out the door and down the street, everyone stood around, realizing the importance of the moment, but just not knowing what to say. And it was Tony at that point who said, let's pray about this. And immediately every head in that diner bowed as Tony lifted her up in prayer, thanking God for all the love in that room. And when he had finished, the burly owner looked him in the eye. What kind of preacher are you? To which Tony replied, well, the kind who is willing to throw a birthday party for a hooker who just needed to know she was loved. Jesus said, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Because Jesus, in his grace, is bound and determined to be a friend of sinners. Just as he has shown us love and mercy, I pray that we too would befriend the sinners around us, sharing with them the best friend anyone could ever have in our Lord Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Would you please rise?